You're listening to the Beyond Sundays podcast, where we tell stories of God's faithfulness from people just like you, because the God who did still does. Our desire is to cultivate conversations about God that help each other take our next steps with Jesus while creating a space to process topics of faith beyond the typical Sunday service. We are continuing our relationship series, and this week I sit down with Dennis and Brenda Greer to talk about God's desire and plan for marriage. With over 40 years of marriage under their belt, this couple oozes with wisdom. They share the many lessons God has taught them through His Word and through life experiences. Y'all, there's a lot of really good nuggets in this one. Plus, stick around for the new segment of the show toward the end where we get practical about next steps. And this time, we are bringing you a fun challenge that you can do every day to strengthen and boost your marriage. So let's get to it. Today, I have a sweet couple with me. I have the Greers, and I'm so excited to have you guys have this conversation all about relationships, have you guys share your testimony. But before we dive into our conversation, which we're going to you know, do later, <laughs> I'd love for you to share a little bit about who you guys are, what you do, and those kinds of things. So okay. who wants to go first? Um, you can go first. Yeah. <laughs> what do we do? I had a job <laughs> for almost 30 years. I was a pharmaceutical rep and absolutely loved my job and planned on doing it until I retired and God had different plans. And it ended shortly before I turned 50. And um, thankfully, by that time, God had gotten a hold of me 20 years earlier and I'd been walking with him and, and loved teaching and speaking. And so uh, he told me to go to seminary. So. At 50, I kind of I did that, <clears throat> and it's interesting. Um, it was good. I'm not sure what we learned there. It was good though. We both went. It was good. Yeah, yeah. we both I'd, went. I'd already started. Yeah. on some classes. Yeah, and and it's interesting. Um, it was clear to me I wasn't supposed to be like a full time pastor, a mm. vocational pastor, but God plugged us into marriage ministry. I would have never chosen it. But 20 years ago, we started doing premaritals and absolutely loved doing premaritals. And then we so kind fun. of transitioned over into marriages. So we've been doing that. That's pretty much what we do every day. I mean, we work with Ringage and we do premarital counseling here, but it's like an everyday thing. <laughs> yeah, we love Reengage. We see God do some of the most miraculous things there as He completely takes two people, mm -hmm. a little different than. Him just working single with one person and right. that heart changing. But in a marriage, you're working with two people, and you're seeing two hearts change. And we just see some amazing, amazing transformations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's great fun. Yeah. yeah. Such a blessing. God designed marriage, mm -hmm. and He designed it to work, right? Mm -hmm. To be successful. But we know in the culture that we live in, that's not necessarily the case for everyone. Right. It's hard. It's difficult. Um the fall caused a lot of things, a lot of issues in marriages. and But the reality is is that God doesn't make things to fail. He, mm -hmm. His desire is for marriages to be successful. And I know you guys have a powerful testimony that I'm excited to share later on. Um, but before we do all of that, I wanted to ask you guys really quick, you know, when I sent you the first email to ask you about coming in, it is because your names were brought up um, by Jaden, who works in reengage and marriage ministry, and um, you know, he said it would be a massive like loss if the Greers were not on your podcast, like to come and have a conversation about marriage because they offer so much wisdom and just dis and just discernment, and they help and they love working with with marriages in all stages of relationships and struggles and success and all the. I mean, just from the gamut of you know, premaritals all the way up, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in that, I want to say first, thank you <laughs> for being willing to come in and share your testimony, but also go deeper with us mm -hmm. and share the wisdom that God has revealed to you mm -hmm. over the 40 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I want to ask you one quick question. I asked you through the email to come in and have a conversation. Why did you say yes? Because we love seeing God work. <clears throat> and if he can use this, uh, that's just the best thing ever, you know. We don't fix anybody's marriages. It's God's job. <laughs> yes. 
So we get to be on board with that, though, and walk with people while they're doing that. And we, it has done so much for our faith to be involved in watching God work in other people's marriages, you know? So I hate to say that's a selfish reason, but I mean, to see people go closer to the Lord in their own personal relationship and how he uses that in marriage and how that impacts the generations, Mm -hmm. (laughs) families and kids, you know? So we love it. Well, and I think, too, we read a lot about marriage. We read a lot of not just Christian authors, but secular authors. And the consensus is that on any given Sunday, probably 50% of the marriages represented in the pews in most churches are struggling at Mm -hmm. some level. And so one of the reasons that I feel like that God just laid this huge burden on our heart for marriages is we just want people to have hope that the answer to whatever their struggle is, while they think they're the only one sitting there secretly in their little chair in church, and they're the only ones struggling with whatever they're struggling with, there are any number of other people that are having those same struggles. Mm -hmm. And so marriage ministry gives us a venue to allow those people to sit in a room together and talk, and all of a sudden you can just kind of see them go, we're not the only ones. We're not the only ones. Other people are struggling too. So let's see what God's answer to these struggles. We know what the world's answer to the struggles sure. are. Mm-hmm. Let's see what God's answer to That's those good. struggles are. Yeah. That's good. I'm excited. Yeah. yeah. So excited. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you guys to share your testimony. We're ready to hear what has God done in your marriage. Well, it really starts before our marriage because God began to work on each of us individually. Um, I had been married previously for seven years, came out of that marriage. Um, I would have at the time said, it was horrible. It was all his fault. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was just as much my issues. Uh, And little by little, the Lord has opened my eyes and still to this day shows me areas that I struggle in and that I really kind of train wrecked mm. what he meant for good. Yeah. We're you know? all capable of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we oh, yeah. all do it. So so I was an easy target, I think, for the enemy and for the culture. Uh, so when we met, um, Dennis was working and I was working and we just instantly really liked each other a lot. I was a drug rep. She worked in a doctor's office. Yeah. So that's how we and met. So that's how you met. That's okay. How we met. And then Aww. he would call a little more frequently and a little more frequently. And yeah. the doctor I was working for didn't really even use any of his products. <laughs> but he just kept coming back. It's like we couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> he liked so, somebody. I saw this pretty girl, you know? <laughs> so, um, so, anyway, we started what turned into a two year relationship or actually about two and a half years before we actually got married. And and um, just as, as we've talked, I mean, we we just did it all wrong. Yeah. We did it all wrong. Yeah. Well, a lot of that comes from me. I mean, I, I was nowhere near a relationship with the Lord, and I was just doing what the world does. And I went to, went off to college, and, you know, it was partying and drinking and sleeping around and all that kind of stuff. And and um, that continued when I got out of school, and, and then I meet her, and, you know, I kind of laugh, and you read Scripture, talks about wallowing in the pit, and I was like, well, I've been wallowing in the pit for a long time, so I just drug her down with me so we could mm-hmm. wallow together. It's a lot more fun, you know, <laughs> if you got somebody to wallow with. Yeah, I was just an easy target. So yeah. we, a I, willing participant. We didn't buy a house together, but we spent we, every night together for two did. years. I mean, we, we pretty did. much we lived together. And, you know, and even not, not being a believer, I knew that wasn't right. I was raised in church, mm-hmm. so I knew that wasn't right. We hid it pretty well. We had our separate houses, but we just never stayed in them by, them by ourselves, you know. I was a believer. Yeah, I mean, was. I was – I grew to love the Lord as a little girl, yeah. and – um my um, my conscience was somewhat seared, I think, at that point. I just didn't want to do what I knew the Lord mm-hmm. would have been more pleased with. I wanted to do what the culture was doing. Mm-hmm. You know, that looked fun. Yeah. You know, and so uh, so it was it was a 
not a difficult transition to just begin living like the world. But it is funny. I mean, we got married May 15th of 81. We never fought. We've Mm -hmm. always had lots of fun. uh, We laugh a lot. Laugh a lot, you know. Um, So even then, when I didn't have a relationship with the Lord, if somebody would look at our marriage and go, oh, man, they have a great marriage. (laughs) Because we looked good, and mm-hmm. we had a lot of fun. We did. But when we God did. got a hold of me and started showing a different way, yeah. oh, my goodness, it just changed everything. Because we were, like most people, we were just following in the pattern of the family we grew up in. Sure. My parents never talked to each other, ever. So I, that's kind of the way I was raised. And her parents had their own dysfunction, and they divorced, you know, before, when she was 20. So we just, we we started doing life like we had seen life Sure. Being we done. tend to default to what we've seen. We, that's what we do. Yeah. That's what we do. We've seen God gets a hold of you and, and yeah. calls you out. That's right. <laughs> and that's what happened. And thank God for that. <laughs> oh, my. Well, and I'm thankful he did it early on. Yeah. Because we'd only been married Three? Three years. Three years. So I was 29 years old when God got a hold of me, and I'm so thankful he did that before we started having kids that we would mm-hmm. have a horrible influence on. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. We're really yeah, thankful. My, the example in my home, we, we did church really well. We looked really good. We My dad was a deacon. My mother taught Sunday school. We were at church every Sunday. And then when my family fell apart due to my dad's infidelity, which is a whole story in and of itself, I just began to look at what I had been raised with and go, hmm, that didn't work. Yeah. (laughs) What was good about that? None of that was true. Yeah. And so it was really easy for me to just kind of fall hook, line, and sinker Mm -hmm. into, well, then do it this other way, Mm -hmm. you know? And Mm -hmm. so there I was. And and, But I I always, always had a heart for the Lord. I always... Read my Bible, and um, I remember when the Lord really, really began to get a hold of Dennis. Uh, it, I was really quick on that train of, yeah, let's find a church to go to. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. You know, let's go. And so we did what we fondly called the Holy Land tour. We tried all that. We'd both been raised Southern Baptist. We decided we were just going to try all the other churches because. We didn't really have any, have a clue why we were Southern Baptist, so so we just started going to all different churches, and we ended up at this little church that taught God's word, and it just overwhelmed us with the truth and the just the passion of God's word, and that's where we fell in love with the Lord really deeply and fell in love with His word. And at the same time, the people, the older people in that church. Had incredible marriages because their their yeah. their relationship with Christ was great. So we got to see what that looked like and, yeah. and how they had it affected their finances and their relationships and their parenting. And so, I mean, we loved falling in love with God's word, and that still impacts us today. But just as much, we love the example that God put us in, so we could see it lived out. Because yes. it's one thing to read truth in Scripture. It's totally different to see it lived out. That's you go, right. oh, that's what that looks like. That's right. You know, It was so, really beautiful. Whew, really thankful. Really beautiful. We learned so much. Yeah. yeah. Learned so much. So what began to change? I mean, God got a hold of you. You began having like a, a real like intimate relationship with Jesus. So how did that, yeah. what did it look like in your marriage as you're growing closer to Jesus? What changed? You know, it took a while for it to affect our marriage. Mm-hmm. That's kind of interesting, you know, because mm-hmm. God was working on me just one on one, and then he already had her. So, man, he got me in love with his word, and I just couldn't get enough of it and got involved in Men's Bible Study Fellowship. And I was reading every day. And within a couple of years, I mean, he showed me I had the gift of teaching. I, who would have thought, you know? So, I started teaching a class at the church and, and absolutely loved that. And like I said, we always had a good marriage. But it really was about 10 years after after God got a hold of, well, actually about seven years after God got a hold of me, we went to a marriage conference. And that's when we were like going, oh, so this is supposed to affect our marriage as well. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know? we'd always had fun. And yeah. we said, well, what could be better than that? Well, yeah. having a Christ-centered marriage can be better than that. You that's know? right. So it was seven years in before it really affected our, our marriage. And and you know that that just affects it a little at a time. You you start listening better. You start 
talking more intentionally. Um, you, you talk about more important things. Yeah. You yeah. talk about, as you study Scripture and as you learn things in Scripture, you, you begin to talk about how that applies mm -hmm. to where you are in life, whether that's personally or whether it's as a couple. Mm -hmm. and, and that just so naturally uh, flowed over into the way we raised our boys mm -hmm. because when they would come to the breakfast table in the morning, we had already set up these habits of, of studying Scripture early and getting our Bible study done early in the day. And so by the time we sat down at the breakfast table with them, we were like, well, let us tell you what we saw in God's Word this morning. Mm -hmm. And to be able to sow into them, not sit down, we're going to have a devotional now, you know, yeah. and that type of thing. It was, it was, let us share with you what God has taught it's us overflow. this morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, overflow. it was just the overflow of our hearts. Mm -hmm. and, and that was so fun, and that is now... Just one of the delights of our life is to see our boys doing that with their families. Yeah, mm. yeah we got our kids involved with Awana, you know, when they were little oh, bitty yeah. kids, and we both worked, worked with Awana. So yeah. we just, I mean, that just became our life. I mean, really, over the course of several years, really, Christ really became our life, every part of it. He changed all of our friends. I mean, we had all of our drinking and partying friends, and we didn't, we didn't change that. God did, yeah. and then within a year, we had a whole new set of friends that we were just that we're just we're still great friends with. You know, we actually kind of worried about that because we did have friends that we lo we've always been people person people 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 people, people. people. <laughs> people, people. Um, we've always loved to be in groups of people, and we worried about those friends that we had that we knew that we could not continue with that type of a friendship. And so we just began to pray about it. And it was so interesting how God just very gently moved the people out of our lives that needed to be moved out of our lives. And then he just brought these incredible people who were journeying along with us, young couples that were journeying along with us and trying to raise their kids the right way. And then the interesting thing is, is some of those friends that he had removed he brought back, and we were able to have some influence in their lives. Mm -hmm. So that was so sweet to mm -hmm. see that happen. We yeah. loved that. Yeah. Well, and in an email that um, I think one of you sent, I'm not sure who, you wrote, a beautiful marriage relationship is a natural byproduct of a growing, vibrant relationship with Christ. Yeah, it sounds like something it's she'd say. The yeah. foundation. <laughs> it was but you. True. Yeah, I think that was me. Absolutely it true. is so true that that has yes. to be our foundation. If we don't have him as a foundation, the relationship won't work. Like at some point it will break. And it breaks hurt. Regardless of what that break looks like and how many people that break affects, it's not mm -hmm. just the marriage relationship, right? Mm -hmm. If you if, if there's a family involved, it yes. affects the family too, but yes. it also affects, just as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. generations, right? Mm -hmm. Because Absolutely. of what we see modeled. But like a, a good godly marriage is built on a foundation, yes. first and foremost, of, of Jesus Christ. There is, and I want to talk about intentionality in just a moment, but there was a quote that I um, heard from. Craig Rochelle recently that there is no intimacy. There's no such thing as intimacy without intentionality. And I think that goes oh, yeah. with relationship with Jesus because that's got to be first and of utmost importance. But then that's also the marriage relationship too, that there's got to be intentionality within the marriage. And I know that just in life in general, there's ebbs and flows. There's seasons where that's harder and more difficult. There's seasons that that's easier, right? And then there are seasons that change. I mean, from I mean, if you think about it, people go from dating to to engaged, engaged to married. They're young married. They're learning to live with one another, which is hard in and of itself. And then eventually, you go from that stage. There's just so many stages into thinking about a family and raising a family and parenting affects so much. And then I'm thinking about our listeners who have our empty nesters and that's a whole nother, I mean, you guys are, yes, whole nother season, right? And so, but the one thing that stays consistent, the one thing that's constant in all of those changes is the rock, the cornerstone, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I know that in each of your relationships with Jesus, he's He's the most important person in your life. Yep. Yep. But your spouse is also 
very, very important to you. They're next. Yeah. yeah. She's number two. Yeah. It's, yeah. He's number two. <laughs> Can you explain? I mean, I grew up hearing that. I grew up hearing that, that it's important to have God first and then your husband or spouse second and then your children and then everything else falls in line after that. Can you put some like practicals to that? Help us, help our listeners understand what does that actually look like? You guys have been married for how many years? 40. 40? Two. 42. 42. You've been married a long time. A long time. You're happy. You have a healthy marriage. Mm -hmm. You're pouring into marriages Mm -hmm. all the time. You enjoy it. It's Mm -hmm. an overflow. Ours is growing. I mean, it still continues to grow. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Because you work on it. And I am married. I've been married, like, it'll be 18 years, I think, this summer. And I'm just thinking... I want my marriage to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. I absolutely want that for my daughters, you know, and Mm. I don't want us to get stale. (laughs) (laughs) But it takes intentionality. Can we talk about that intentionality for a moment? What does it look like to have an intentional? I mean, we know what intentionality looks like with Jesus. Mm -hmm. What does it look like for each other? Well, I think some of that comes from, I mean, we we both are, are big students of Scripture. We spend hours every day in Scripture. But it's interesting, I don't know how many years ago it was, that we started looking at a lot of, there's not a lot of marriage verses in the Bible. There's some. There's not a lot. But there are lots of relationship verses in the Bible. That's and right. you start applying those relationship verses to the marriage relationship, which is the most important earthly relationship we have, <laughs> then all of a sudden you've got a lot of stuff to work on. <laughs> Because that, to me, I think that's a lot of it is is applying what I'm what I'm hearing from God when I'm reading in His Word. First of all, to this relationship, because this is the this is the only one that Scripture says that we're one. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not my kids, it's not my best friends, and and in order to make that happen, we've got to be on the same page. So, thankfully, we're on the same page spiritually, we're on the same page emotionally for the most part. I'm I'm getting there. I mean it's it's been a long of a journey. <laughs> <You're growing. but laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying I've worked a lot on that with him. <laughs> Still got some ways to go. But we're getting there, you know. But all those aspects, uh I mean even the little things that come up during the day, just to be able to talk about them, you know, and we don't we don't sweep stuff under the rug anymore. It's good. You talk about those yeah. things. Because we've learned a lot of that from Marine Gates because we work with a lot of people. Yeah. Like yeah. everybody sweeps those things under the rug, and eventually that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to well, talk about them. And I think, too, especially now, we are a very emotion-driven culture. Yeah. And if you want to have a really great marriage, your emotions can't drive your bus. Oh, that's good. You can't. I mean, we heard uh, one of our favorite marriage speakers is, is Ted Cunningham, and he has this a um, little, little illustration he does with a school bus. And he has these different labels that he puts in the driver's seat of the school bus. And if the um, if emotion is in the driver's seat of the school bus, you're in trouble. Yeah. yeah. Scripture needs to be in the driver's seat. The truth of God's word, yeah. And yeah. experience and tradition need to be right next mm-hmm. to that. Because mm-hmm. if you're being driven by Scripture, then your experience and your tradition is going to follow closely to a biblical model. And that's good. Okay? Mm-hmm. And so as we watch marriages that we encounter on a daily basis, if emotion is what is driving that relationship, at some point, probably at least one person, but both people are going to get really offended. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, the, one of the scriptures that we love is, it is to man's glory to overlook an offense yeah. in Proverbs. And and I think that that was something that happened early on because I was an awfully emotional person uh, and, and I had really let He's shaking my head. The people that are listening yeah. to this can't see him shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> He's but, in agreement. <laughs> but but I was way, way over on the emotional side because I'd had a lot of things happen in my life sure. that had been unpredictable. Mm-hmm. My parents' marriage, falling apart, divorce. Uh, there, there just was and, – and we had more emotional things coming our way. Yeah. I mean, God, God is so faithful – to to grow us to a point and then allow something to come into our life that kind of rattles our cage a little mm-hmm. bit that we've got to go, oh, my goodness, what am yeah. I going to do with this? Mm-hmm. And for us, it was with the birth of our second son. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, we had at, at three years into marriage, we had this bouncing baby boy that was healthy. I mean, he was great. He was beautiful. He was just the best little kid ever. And then we had the second pregnancy, and that baby was born at 28 weeks. Wow. And I was flown to Fort Worth to Cooks, and we lived hour to hour, minute to minute for for several weeks. Mm-hmm. And he is now 37 years old with three little boys of his well, own. Then, then he but, almost died when he was 18 months old. I mean, yeah, he, he had we, some health issues. He had some wow. health issues, so issues as a preemie. It was front and center pretty much in our... Yeah, and, and so we couldn't let emotion drive that bus mm-hmm. because every day changed, and we were in that together. Mm-hmm. But God... But God... <laughs> Grew us, got us through that. I unbelievably, mean, that's probably where. If I look back over all those thirty years of walking with the Lord, thirty-eight, that the way He started me off, just when a few years after He got a hold of me, He grew our faith so much stronger during that horrible season. You know yeah. that we 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 had kind of given Him up for dead. I mean, because we yeah. we didn't think He was going to make it, and. Wow. And boy, God just grew our faith. Yeah, we had a night at Hendrick Hospital that they moved a ventilator into his room as an 18 month old and said, He's going to die. He's probably not going to make it. He's probably not going to make it. And And what a challenge. What a challenge because in those high intensity trauma situations where you don't know the outcome, I mean, this is your heart, your flesh and blood. You're like, Yes. In these types of situations, marriages typically either Mm. end. Or they get through it, yes. right? I mean, this is this is one of those battles that's that's hard for many people to pull through to the other side yes. and still love one another. It's yeah. it's so painful. I mean, so much pain, especially when it's your child. And so, I mean, like, what got you through? What was it specifically that helped you get through that season? Well, I mean, that trauma season on that that really severe season. It was still confidence in God's word. He is who he says he is. That didn't change at all. He he was the rock. He was our strength. Even though you don't know what that looks like in that moment, yeah. <laughs> but you you declare that you you're putting your faith on him. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're praying together. We're still looking at scripture. You know, and and, the, and we have this godly group of friends that really stepped up. The community was know? huge for us. Yeah. Greg and Vicki Teagle yeah. walked yeah. through that with us. Really? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, precious. Yes, yeah. they were with us that night in ICU. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not only was he Wes's doctor, but they were just our best friends. So yeah. we spent a lot of time with them. A lot of they time. Great. Okay, P.S. did not know that. <laughs> I did not know that. I love <laughs> Greg and Vicki. Yeah. yeah, so community, if you have the right community. <laughs> yes, it's community. so important. Oh, my goodness. It's incredible. Oh, my goodness, because they can speak truth. Into you, oh, and they can help yeah. you hold your hands up in the middle of the night when you're yep. exhausted. That's right, yep. totally exactly. depleted. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so all of that together um, served as a just an enormous boost of our faith, and drew us. You know, those those types of situations have the potential to either drive you apart mm-hmm. or pull you together. Mm-hmm. And and that's where our faith and our dependence on Christ through all of those dark nights of not knowing mm-hmm. with a sick child, um, that was what drew us together. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I really, I mean, I look back on that and I'm like going, I, I, well, I hated it when we were in the midst of it. Oh, yeah. I hated it, but now I love it. Because I see what God did. Well, in all those critical situations, if you respond the right way in faith, when you come through that, regardless of what the outcome is, when you come through that, you know God better in a way you wouldn't have known otherwise. <clears throat> and that's every time we've had one of those things, you look back and you got to know him better because he was faithful. Yeah. We mm-hmm. wouldn't be who we are Mm-mm. Mm-mm. if that hadn't happened. Yeah. So I would do it all over again mm-hmm. to be where we are. Yep. You need to tissue, you good? Mm-hmm. I'll just recover. We're good. We'll take a moment. <laughs> we got time. I love that. Thank yeah. you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm going to ask you a question, but it might not be on record. But what is it, I mean, in all your 
years, recent years of marriage ministry, what are people struggling with most? <laughs> I don't talk to as many mar- like marriages in that situation, right? You know, it's I fun. hear it. I told y'all, I, I've been, did I tell y'all that I've been praying for a lot of marriages on, at the altar? Yeah. And mm-hmm. most of them are in dire straits where yeah. one partner is threatening or saying, I'm ready for divorce. Yeah. That's, that is yeah, why I feel like Holy Spirit was just like relationships, relations, talk about this, talk about this, yeah. and why he's doing it in several pockets around the church. You know, it's funny. As many people as come to reengage, while you do have those you know affairs and you have alcoholism and drug abuse and all that stuff... Generally, those aren't the problems. Okay. Generally, the people over four or five years of marriage, life happens. They have kids. They change jobs. They quit talking. Mm-hmm. They get their priorities out of order. Yeah, and and they look up and it's been ten years, and they haven't talked for the last five years, and they don't don't know how to talk. Mm-hmm. And and I think the thing that that just recently the thing that hits me that the biggest issue in marriage really it's just selfishness. I mean, we are just. Our flesh is just stinking selfish. Yeah, yeah. And and we have to and, fight it. And marriage yeah. is an affront to selfishness. If you do mm, marriage God's yes. way, yes, you can't be selfish. That's right. <laughs> you know, you got to humble yourself. You got to put her needs ahead of my own. And people don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that gets back to your relationship with the Lord. Because mm-hmm. the stronger your relationship with the Lord is, you're going to understand that humility. You're going right. to understand it wasn't a suggestion that he told me to love her as Christ loved the church. That's right. It was a command. That's you right. Because he knows it would be best for me and for her. Mm-hmm. So all that gets back to how strong your relationship is with the Lord. We've seen people at Reengage, God just do miraculous things and come to find out. They had had a great relationship with the Lord and just kind of wandered away, and then he reignited that. You know, We see people that come to faith there, but it is it's all faith-based. It's all your relationship with God because mm-hmm. the closer my relationship, the closer I'm walking with him, the more kind I'm going to be to her, the, more, the quicker I'm going to forgive her, the quicker I'm going to overlook offenses, all those things. And it all boils down to my relationship with the Lord That's good. and how that is on a day-to-day basis. That's good. Yeah. We have a little saying in reengage. Anybody that's listening that's been through reengage has heard this. They probably get really tired of hearing this. <laughs> Draw a circle around yourself and work on everything within that circle. That's good. And and that's constantly our message is that yes, you come to reengage to work on your marriage. But truly you come to reengage to work on yourself before the Lord. Mm-hmm. And marriage is just the context in which we do that work. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Because if you are working on your marriage, on your relationship with the Lord, and He is working on His relationship with the Lord, it, it's that old triangle thing of the two of you are at the bottom of the triangle on opposite sides. I thought about sides, that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as yeah. you work toward the top, toward God, mm-hmm. you get closer together. That's mm-hmm. right. And I'm telling you that that's a truth. It's truth. I think it is people, truth. I think a lot of times people are surprised when they first come to reengage. They think it's a marriage ministry. It's really a discipleship ministry. A discipleship. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> all good. those lessons are one on your relationship with the Lord. All of those lessons. Because yeah. honestly, if this relationship getting, is getting better and hers is getting better, then we're going to be closer. You know, yeah. yeah. That's so that's good. why we love doing marriage ministry too. It's just mm-hmm. disi- discipleship, and that's what God's called us to. Mm-hmm. So I hear you saying, like, I mean, for any marriage, for any marriage, regardless of what season you're you're in or what troubles you may be facing, the most important thing is to trust Jesus mm-hmm. with your deepest longings, your yeah. deepest needs. Yeah. Your spouse can't do that. Mm-hmm to keep him first and foremost in your life. It's all it's it's just coming down to the priorities of things. Yeah. It, is. it is. And I know that with the enemy like he and I hear I heard this from I think Tony Evans. He the enemy comes and attacks at the point of unity. Mm. That is his goal. He he's a divider. He wants to divide and bring dissension and tension and division and Marriage is supposed to be a place where we see God's image on this earth, right? Well, yes. it takes two and makes them one. Yes. So wouldn't the enemy fight to divide that yeah. oneness? Yeah. Yeah. That is the only relationship in Scripture that is taking two people and making one. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the second chapter of Genesis. It's right. the very beginning. Mm-hmm. It's it's the thesis statement of marriage. Yeah. 
is that he takes two and he makes them one. That's not said about our children because they're going to grow up and they're going to leave. And the empty nest is going to happen, and you're going to look across the breakfast table and go, oh, my goodness, I haven't talked to you in 18 years. <laughs> you know, And that's not that's God's, a challenge. <laughs> that's not God's yeah. best for yeah. us. Well, and it gives your kids a horrible picture of marriage, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? When, if you make them the priority, ooh, that's a horrible picture for your kids to see in marriage. You know, you, mm-hmm. With premaritals, you get a, a 22-year-old young man and young woman whose families have both made it all about them, and they're going to come together in a marriage and try to serve each other and sacrifice for each other? Probably not. Yeah. They're <laughs> yeah. going to go, how can you serve me? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Right. that's right. Maybe without asking, but te- technically, that's what they're expecting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. We yeah. yeah. We expect our spouses to be mm-hmm. the one. Uh, they're, they're the source of our happiness. Mm. But no, they're not. Right. Christ is the source of that's our right. happiness. Yeah. You know, um, I think Gary Thomas's book, Sacred Marriage, is such a great one because he says, what if our marriages were not about making us happy, but about making us holy? Oh, that's good. And yeah. I love that well, subtitle. That's when it first really dawned on us that really God's purpose in marriage is sanctification. You know, yes. that, that's his. That's yes. that's why He has us on this earth. That's why He didn't take us to heaven when He saved us, because we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of growth to do. That sanctification process. And where else does that happen more than in a marriage relationship? This person you're spending all this time with, mm-hmm. that you, that who knows you better than anybody else on this earth, better than everybody yes. else that you're supposed to serve and sacrifice for and meet their needs. Well, and I think your your comment about intentionality, using that word, that, that's a word that comes up a lot yeah. when we do marriage ministry is, how are you being intentional? But, but I think that um, if rather than when things kind of go off the rails in your marriage, and our first instinct is to look at our spouse and yeah. go, look what you've done. You know, look what you've done to me. You've hurt my feelings. You've not done this the way I expected you. You've, you're, you've not met my expectations. You yeah. Know? What if instead, it, with intentionality, we thought, hmm, I wonder what God is trying to show me. Mm-hmm. If, if this has bothered me this much... I mean, we we run into couples all the time where one spouse has just got their nose out of joint about the other spouse instead of looking at themselves. It's that drawing that circle thing. (laughs) Instead of staying in your circle and going, oh, God, why did you show me this? You know, what is it that you're trying to show me in me Mm -hmm. that you need to bring correction there as opposed to me leveling my vision on my spouse and going, would you fix him? Yeah. You know? Because I, I guarantee you, everybody that comes in to re-engage, I mean, we were there last night with a full chapel, and I would venture to say that 99% of the people sitting in those chairs think, if they just get him fixed, we'd be fine. Yeah. And he, and the man is thinking, if they just get her fixed, we'd be fine. Yeah. You know, instead of... God. It's a lie. Yeah, it's a lie. That it is a statement lie. is a lie. Yes. So we need to get that out of our mouths. <laughs> Wash our mouths, Lord. Like, That's get that right. out of our mouth. And yeah, fix our eyes on him and yep. ask Jesus, what is it that you're showing yep. me? What is it that I'm not seeing? I'm, I mean, we. it's so easy to be blinded to your own stuff oh, when yeah. you're focusing on someone else's. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because every time that you have success in that area and you really do see what God is showing you, mm-hmm. um, that just bonds your hearts together. It brings life. Yeah. It does. Instead of it death. Does. It brings life. That's a great mm-hmm. statement. Well, I think mm-hmm. one of the things we have to ask ourselves, I mean, if God's purpose in marriage is sanctification, then he wants the people around us, our kids and our neighbors and our good friends, he wants us to see Christ in our marriage and how we treat each other. Because I tell you, that gets people's attention in today's world. Cause, Absolutely. You know, marriage is are not succeeding very well. Absolutely. And and for a, a married couple, for people to be able to see Christ, see forgiveness, see kindness, see Humility. gentleness in them. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. You know, so we've like we've we've really kind of decided that we think marriage is God's greatest evangelism tool, you know? Absolutely. And a lot of times you don't even have to say anything. They just see how you treat each other and it'll get their attention. <laughs> yeah, we wonder how we can bless others. <sighs> Work on your marriage. Work have a good marriage. marriage. Have Absolutely. a good marriage because you're literally yeah. showing the world 
who Jesus is. You are, and you're, you're showing, showing your kids. Yeah. You're showing your kids that, that this is the most important relationship, is this one right here with Christ, and yeah. the impact it has on this relationship is what they need to be looking for eventually, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. That's good. So I know you've used a couple of words I would love, because, well, you went to school and got your theology oh. degree. Yeah. So could you explain what is sanctification? Could you explain that? Yeah, I mean, there's different ways you can look at it. There's an element, when we are justified and we come to faith in Christ, there's an element of sanctification being set apart That's right. for Him. That's what sanctification is. But then once we enter into that relationship we have with Christ, then it's the goal of our whole life is becoming more like Him. I've, I've always kind of thought, when we get saved, God changes my inside and sanctification is the rest of my life allowing him to change my outside. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so my outside matches my inside. Yeah. Yeah, it's just becoming more like Christ. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't care how much you work on that and how far down that road you get, you are still so far yeah. <laughs> away yeah. from where you want to be, you yeah. know, because we mess up every day. Yeah. Every it's a, day. It's a process. It's definitely a journey. And we're all in different places with the Lord. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But... It's a consistent thing when we want it to be, and that's true intimacy, right? If you're right? intentional, you get yeah. back to that intentionality. Just right. like in marriage, our relationship with the Lord, the Lord has to be intentional. Yes, you know, it you does. don't, you don't. What's the what's the phrase we heard? You don't drift into holiness. I mean, it, you're you're swimming upstream. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially it's, in this culture, it is with and, all and, the distractions. Yes. And, and you're going yes. against what your flesh wants to do. Yeah, and no, and nothing in the world is going to tell you to do that. Yeah, you know, yeah. go go with your heart, all that kind of stuff. That's the worst advice ever. <laughs> <laughs> I know my heart. <laughs> well, there's so many deceptive philosophies out there, and you know, Scripture talks about that. You know, in the last days, there's going to be all kinds of deception. You mm-hmm. know, and I feel like, and, and and I will take ownership of this because of my generation. I mean, I was in college in the early '70s, and and I heard Helen Reddy singing "I'm Woman." Yeah. Henry Roar. Yeah. And I watched the feminist movement. That was the roots. That was when the feminist movement, which had been going on for about 30 years, but that's when they became very focused on college campuses. Mm-hmm. And and the young women, it was like, well, I'm a woman. I mean, I can control this whole situation. You know, y'all just step aside. And mm-hmm. so the feminist movement stepped in and did a great injustice to your generation, mm-hmm. you know. And so it's hard to back that train up and go back and recapture what biblical womanhood really looks like, you know, because in in a marriage, we – I mean, I, I love hearing Dennis explain what, what sanctification is mm-hmm. because I love listening to how God has given him the ability to teach and to understand, and, and I get – to be a recipient of all of that. And so that's one of the greatest joys mm-hmm. is to be led by a godly man. Mm-hmm. You know, and and it scripture talks about us as women being submissive and the feminist movement completely has deconstructed that. Mm-hmm. And so now it's just really refreshing when I see a godly man that his wife can go, oh, yeah, I can follow that, mm-hmm. you know. It's more freeing, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I Absolutely. love the covering I have for my husband. I yes. love that spiritual covering. And I know that it is a good covering because he is under submission and authority to Christ yes. himself. That's you exactly know what I mean? Right. And I feel confident in that. I'm, it's so much easier to follow a man who's submitted to Christ yes. because yeah. I'm not afraid. Nope. The most thing, the, uh, as women... We long for security and stability. It's something we long for. And when that's messed up, we there's a lot of fear there yeah. in our hearts, right? And to have a man that is submitted in body and mind and heart and spirit to the Lord, there is nothing greater to me than that right there. That's right. Well, and you think if, if a guy is really pursuing godliness and being a godly man that God wants designed him to be, and he looks at that first instruction in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Whew. So you think about women's role is to respect and submit, 
But that's kind of what the man's role, if, if you are giving it's yourself up. Both and. It, 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 to me, it's yeah. the same thing that's yes. just worded differently. We're both giving ourselves up for each other, yeah. which there again is the affront to our selfishness because our yeah. flesh doesn't like us doing that. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, our flesh is not redeemed. You know, our, our soul, our spirit is redeemed. Our flesh is going to fight against that all the time. <laughs> And, and that's probably, what people run up against, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. But, when well, they're experiencing you know, those problems and they're going, what yeah. is up and how right. did we get here? It's that flesh. And they make horrible decisions based on something, you know, it, they're not taking every thought captive. Yeah. <laughs> and the enemy can put those thoughts in your mind and, you know, I'm not happy. I should get a divorce. Well, you know, that didn't come from the Holy Spirit. And that's an emotion <laughs> driving it's, it's emotion. a decision. You're, you're exactly right. Yeah. Which is it's what deception. you talked about earlier. Yeah. Deception. And you, when you hear those things that don't line up with Scripture, you know the source. It's not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? But so. the key to that is you have to know Scripture. <laughs> yeah. Right. Get in the Word. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. get in the word because this crazy culture we live in, it mm-hmm. sounds really good. Yeah. A lot of those things sound really good. And easier. It I mean, sometimes sense. it just seems like it would yeah. be easier for people. Like they yes. that's what I hear um the culture saying. Yes. That it's easier to end it. Yeah. It's no big deal. God yeah. wants me to be happy. That's right. And you're not making me happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, but the like pain on the other job. side of that. The pain yeah. on the other side of that. Yeah. Such a lie. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's her job to make me happy. Again, it's going back to we can't expect if God never made our spouse to fulfill our deepest longings and, and our Mm-mm. deepest desires, which includes joy and right. happiness, right? Mm-hmm. That's not That's right. our the source cannot be our spouse. It cannot be any human on this planet. You're right. It cannot be anything. You're right. You know, if anything is on the throne of our hearts, then yeah. we're gonna have problems. You're exactly right. That's right. Yep. That's right. For sure. Well, I know we need to wrap up. We're, this has been a great conversation. Lots of really good deep mm-hmm. things. So thank you guys so much. Um what is is there anything else like specifically that you'd love to share before we wrap up? I don't know if you have a space for this, but but one of the things I think sometimes reengaged gets a bad rap mm-hmm. because it it we hear all of the crazy story, all the horror stories of these incredible redemptions, you know, which that's wonderful, but Good marriages need to also think about coming to re-engage. Because Getting better. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You can always get better. I mean, that's, that's a good the word. Thing. Every time we go through, we've led, we're getting ready to lead our seventh group, seventh, I think. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And um, every time we lead a group, we go through the book with them. I mean, we do it just as though we've never done it before. And every time we run across things that we think, why have we not talked about this? Yeah. You know, after 42 years, you'd think we'd talked about everything. But honestly, the last group that we had, we had some of the best conversations. Because a lot of Wednesday nights, we go home and we go sit out on the patio and we'll rehash the questions for the evening and talk about them personally because we don't typically give our answers in our group. We allow the group to talk. Um, but it's pretty interesting how the Lord just reveals things and shows new things to us. That's so you can teach old dogs new tricks. Oh. <laughs> and we're well, always tra- changing. That's you right. Know, we're growing. always changing. Just like you talked about, you go to those different stages. That's right. Glory to glory. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. that's right. That's what yeah. we're made to do. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think I, I would say... Beware of, I think in one of your emails you sent, you made some comment about autopilot. Yeah, autopilot, Just yeah. beware of that because uh-huh. that, that is what our flesh loves. Push that autopilot button and you don't have to do anything. Yeah. And eventually you're going to run out of fuel and you're going to crash. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's what would happen to an airplane that, that's right. lived, that lived on autopilot. That's right. They didn't come and get refueled. You're exactly right. And get right. grounded again. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's important to be grounded again. It, it really is, is. with yeah. one another it and is. with Jesus yeah. together. I mean, yeah. all of it's imperatively important. Yeah. Like, y'all, it really, really is. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. And, you know, you don't have to come to re engage. We encourage people. There are great Christian books on marriage mm-hmm. that have questions at the end of the chapters. We encourage people to do one of those a year. Yeah. It'll take you a couple of months of the year and you sit down in the evening and read a chapter and answer those questions. And, oh, my goodness. It would just, you're just being intentional. Yeah. Some yeah. ways that Jeff and I have been intentional have been. Um, 
to do resets, you know, like especially at the beginning of the year, yeah. we reset, we have some deep conversations, we're talking about the next year, expectations, those kinds of things. But we like, we love, not even like, we love doing premarital counseling with couples because it keeps some of those foundational principles in, in yes. front of us. And we're having conversations. We're listening to couples have conversations and then we're having conversations, right? <laughs> and we're being sharpened. We're being encouraged. We're being strengthened by God's word, by community. Obviously in life group, that's another place where we see marriages that are ahead of us and what they're navigating. I mean, that's a huge deal to us. Mm -hmm. It always has been it's good. for us to have couples who are ahead in stages ahead of where we are so that we can learn from them mm -hmm. and where they're at. And we, I mean, I'm so thankful for our life group leaders. I'm thankful for the other couples in our group that are, ahead of where we are. Um, but beyond that, yeah, we are looking at some marriage retreats. We're looking at some content to do together. And I think it's important. I, the word work, I think, has a bad connotation right now in this culture, but work is not bad. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, all good things take some work. Yeah. And we're right? all lazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the root issue. And we are lazy. We want it. We, when we want it right now. We want it easy. Yeah. yeah. want it given to us. Tell her your illustration that you do about beautiful lawns. Oh. <laughs> I like this. Because he works in the yard all the time. Oh, that's well, awesome. Well, we had a retired neighbor back before I was retired, and, and he always shamed me because his yard was beautiful. Oh, know? yeah. And I then after I retired, I had time to I, I work. I don't have that yard. Somebody <laughs> else in my neighborhood does. <laughs> but I started prioritizing my yard after I got retired, and a really nice yard, and, you know, and people would would, we have a lot of people come to the house, you know, for counseling and stuff, and people always go, oh, I love your yard. And I used to say, well, thank you, you know, and now I say, it requires a lot of work. Just like your marriage requires a lot of work. Amen. It requires watering. It requires pulling weeds. It requires fertilizer. All those things, you can have a pretty yard, too, if you're willing to put the work in. <laughs> the grass ain't always greener on the other side. <laughs> that's, Let's, that's because they water more and use yeah, fertilizer. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> but you can have it too. You can too. <laughs> right. Just like a good godly marriage. Yeah, and it's never too late. Can we just can we go there? Oh, uh, it's yeah. never too we've late. We've had people go through engage that have been married 50 years and they're in their 70s, and we've seen God do incredible because we see them and we go, oh, they've got it all figured out. They don't. Yeah. And and I love that that they admit that they don't have it figured out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We have a lot of facilitators in Reengage that are in their fifties, sixties. Fifties and sixties. Mm -hmm. That's we'll stop. Okay, we'll stop there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that that's always fun for the younger couples to see. Absolutely. That they still laugh together and they still have a great time together. And they've got all these years of marriage behind them, you know, and that's mm -hmm. good for young couples to see that this is this is where you can be headed can if we, you'll do the work. Can well, we I'm, speak to that, too, because you guys are, I, I mean, I, I haven't known you very long, but I look up to you. I look up to your marriage. I want the marriage that you have mm -hmm. when I get to where you are. I mean, and, and I'm in my 30s, so I need people in my life who are – that far ahead that mm -hmm. I can go, that's how it's done. Yeah. What does it look like to get there? Yeah. I want that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm speak I know I'm speaking for my generation, but we need yours. Yeah. We need your generation mm -hmm. to show us what does it look like to run this race mm -hmm. with that length of time. Yeah. I don't want to get old and you know and stale yeah. in my relationship and that's with my why husband. Our marriages need to reflect Christ because oh, people yeah. in your generation are looking yeah. here. Mm -hmm. One so. of the things we say all the time is I mean, I know it's inevitable that we're getting older. It just, it's <laughs> it just, just happens. You know, yeah. the alternative is not as good. You know, as being, <laughs> but I want to stay relevant until the day I take my last breath. That's I said so good. Sometime, yeah. I said one time to a friend, I said, I want to die tired. There you go. Yeah. You know, I, I want, I've just finished a Bible study with some women in the book of Daniel, and he's in his 80s, and he's still praying getting on his knees and praying, and he is still relevant to those around him. Amen. And that's – I'm not to 80 yet. <laughs> it's coming quickly. You're not even close. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to remain relevant. I want to remain relevant to your generation. I want to be one of those – people that somebody wants to sit down and say, well, I wonder what she has to say about yeah. this, mm -hmm. you know, and I want it to be good, solid, biblical. It's not what I have to say. It's what Amen. God's taught me through the years. That's good. That's so good. 
Well, I have to say, you're both relevant. <laughs> Thank you for your wisdom. <laughs> the wisdom that you've gleaned from yeah. experience and mm. time in God's word mm. and the work that he's asked you to put in mm. to keep that yard green. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there till the day we die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't always do this, but I'd love to ask, would you mind wrapping us up with a prayer over marriages? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Father, we are thankful for your love for marriages. It was your design. It was your plan from the very beginning. <clears throat> and I know that, that has been messed up a lot. <clears throat> uh, but the, the, the good news is that you are always right there willing to step in. And, and sometimes we uh, say that you help us in our marriages, but ultimately you're the one who does that work if we allow you. So, Father, I pray a blessing over those marriages that are listening to this. Um, no marriage is perfect. Everyone has got things to work on, and we work on that through our relationship with Christ, and we are thankful for the presence of his spirit in our lives that brings that conviction um, so I just challenge each one of these marriages, Father, just to press into Christ and their relationship with Christ and to uh, allow those uh, attributes that, that we have because of his spirit who lives in us to affect our marriage in a way that people will actually see Christ through our marriages. Uh, that's your work. You get all the credit for that, Father. But we just thank you for loving us, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so mm -hmm. much. Oh my goodness, I loved this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it too. There certainly were a ton of really great quotes I wrote down, so I wanted to share them with you. Just check out our show notes for this episode or head on over to our social media post that we created today. We've got a few of our favorite one-liners that you can easily save to your phone or share with friends. Also, it's time for the part of the show where we talk about practical next steps. This time, we wanted to share with you a tip that the Greer shared with me after we stopped recording today's episode. It will actually help boost your marriage today. This three-ingredient recipe for a successful marriage is easy to remember and simple to do. Just take advantage of this simple recipe that will encourage marital unity. All right, here it is. 30 seconds of kissing. 30 minutes of intentional conversation. And three minutes of prayer every day. That's it. It's that simple. 30 seconds of kissing, 30 minutes of intentional conversation, and three minutes of prayer every day. Living by these three simple rules will help keep your marriage fresh and strong as you grow closer to the Lord and to each other. All right, for additional resources that the Greers recommended, I wanted to go ahead and give you those links and resources too. So check out the show notes if you want to build a marriage that lasts head on over to our show notes. And as always, thanks so much for listening to the Beyond Sundays podcast. We hope you guys have a wonderful day. And remember, God is always moving and he's moving in your life too and your marriage beyond Sundays. Bye.